Hello, everyone. Um, I'm told to go ahead and get started. So I am happy to be with you this morning and navigating these complex but well-supported technologies. Sorry that I can't be with you um, in person due to restrictive policies at my institution around international travel, but I'm grateful for the flexibility of being able to present live in person or live virtually with you today. So my name is Lisa Janicki Hilliff. I'm a professor and librarian at the University of Illinois at Urbana Champaign. And I'm speaking to you today about transformative agreements and read access and the degree to which they are expanding access to paywalled content. This is a sneak peek of the piece that will be on the Scholarly Kitchen tomorrow morning, expanded access to paywalled content, a hidden benefit and transformative agreements. I'm gonna start situating ourselves in our conversation today in the context of how we pay right now for own access. And we mean, broadly speaking, anyone paying on the non-publisher side of open access. So we obviously have the micropayments model with article processing charges, which have been aggregated into transformative agreements and pure publish agreements, transformative for hybrid publishing, pure publish for full open access journals. We also have a variety of other models, the collect action or subscription model funding open access, like subscribe to open, direct to open, fit open. Uh, and we have some subvention models, philanthropy, membership, and the like. Today, I'm going to be focusing on a particular model of micropayment and the transformative agreement for moving hybrid journals to an increased amount of open access publishing and uh, foster publishing from a given institution or set institutions through the transform agreement. In 2019, I wrote what has now become one of my most transcribed in the kitchen posts, transform agreements, a primer. It was very clear that these were emerging in the uh, industry as a way of fostering and accelerating open access publishing. Specifically, my notion is that the transformative agreement is a contract that acts a library's budget or the university's debt. It has the impact of opening content and paying publishers for that publishing service. But what is truly transformed is actually the library spend. And it shifts the contract of payment from the library or a group of libraries or a consortium to a publisher away from focused on subscription-based reading and towards open access as publishing. We have sort of two models uh, that we've talked about in the literature, read and publish and publish and read. Um, in a nutshell, you can just understand that in publish and read, all of the payment on the published side and reading sort of thrown in as a freebie. There's no contractual calculation anymore for the reading access. In read and publish, there's a calculation for both read and publishing that are then combined in order to um, have an overall contract total. So read and publish is a lot of details on how those proportions could be. Publish and read moves it all over to the publish side and our kind of quintessential example publish and read is the agreement with Project Deal and either Wiley or Turner Nature, where all the payment is on the published side. The scale of transformative agreements varies greatly. Um, very large scale agreements like Project Bills with Wiley and Springer Nature, the JISC agreement with Miller and Francis, the University of California agreement with Elsevier and Cambridge University Press. Thousands and thousands and thousands of articles published every year in larger scale transformative agreements. We also have smaller scales. We have ones with single institutions like Iowa State University and the American Physiological Society, UNC Chapel Hill and SAGE. We also have single journal agreements like the disc collections agreement that might be applied to a single journal. There are a variety of ways that these are structured. We also have variations and innovations. Um, our rebate model currently being filed and tested at UNC Chapel Hill with SAGE. Um, for every two articles published and access, SAGE rebate a credit to UNC Chapel Hill that can be used for an author. We have read, publish, and join the American Physiological Society, where anyone who publishes under the transformative agreement is automatically granted a one-year membership in the society. 
Most recently announced the backflip model of Neural and Elsevier, which bundles together subscription reading access with an annual retrospective opening of five years of the neural third content for every year that the agreement is in place. So we also see a lot of variations on transformative agreements. So we see these sorts of headlines, right? celebrating 30,000 open access articles, Project and Wiley. Librarians agreements offer researchers options to open access publishing, UN's Chapel Hill. Read and publish deals drive increase in OA research content. Uh, I think that's Oxford University Press or Cambridge University Press. It's probably bad that I don't remember which one. Uh, but we see these kinds of headlines and we see this continuous focus on how transformative agreements are fitting open access publishing. But absent from the headlines is the hidden reality that there's increased access to subscription content in many, many transformative agreements. Almost all of them of any scale have some sort of increased access to subscribed content, which is an interesting feature that it increases reach, reader access to paywall content. So these open access agreements, while they are intended and successfully do open thousands of articles, they have this hidden benefit of opening the paywall literature to a particular set of subscribers. So I probably shouldn't have said open there. It has a hidden effect of getting entitlements to paywalled content to a larger scale of readers. So this is very much rooted in the big deal that we might remember from the early 2000s when libraries agreed to buy all electronic access to all of a publisher's journals for a price that was based on current payments to the publisher plus some increment. So historic subscription spend drove libraries and shaped the way we contracted for electronic access to journals. Really, the transformative agreement these days is a bigger big deal. We have pushing services added to an already existing bundled subscription package. Libraries are often seeking cost-neutral models for this. Sometimes it's the existing subscription payment, so literally just what you were paying to read, you now pay to read and publish. Sometimes it's the existing subscription plus the current institutional APC spend. Both these are talked about as being cost neutral to the institution. We also have a case though that many libraries don't actually have the full complete package. What they have is some sort of subset that's a custom bundle of their library or their uh, consortium. And then you have publishing services added to an existing custom bundled subscription package where we also have different cost models there, which is an existing subscription fame neutral existing subscription plus APC spend. And in this case, cost models where you have additional payment for reading because the amount of reading is increasing, the amount of paywalled content somebody has access to. So just to sort of get a scope of what this means, um, different agreements have increased access to the paywalled content different ways. So for example, the University of California agreement with Bringer Nature made 1,000 additional articles available across the University of California system from Springer Nature alone. That's a significant increase in the portfolio of Spring Nature that scholars at California now have access to. Similarly, Ohio and Cambridge University Press, a smaller publisher in the sense of over our portfolio, but we still see that with those 400 some journals from Cambridge University Press, every academic li every library in Ohio link gained some titles and some libraries gained more than 200 titles, so doubling their access to the Cambridge University Press by bundling up consortium spend in a transformed agreement that at zero cost to the total spend of the consortium is increasing paywalled access while providing open access publishing. And one example so far in the literature where we know what the effect is of opening so many titles. In the project deal and why agreement, there's also an increased ability to access paywalled content. And in the most recent report that they put out, porting on that agreement, 
they were able to dominate the access to subscribe content, to paywall content, increased 44% from 2018 to 2020 due to the rigors of previously non subscribing institutions having access to this paywall content. So you get more access, and then we're seeing people use that access. I imagine we'll see similar reports coming out of many others of these kinds of agreements. We also see that small publishers have this same sort of a kind of structure where you'll get increased reading access. So it's not just the big publishers. So as an example, in the company of biology's read and publish program, if you were a subscriber to only one or two of their three journals, your payment to get reading access to all three will stay whatever your subscription price was, plus your annual APC spend if you're because you're going into a transformative agreement. So the cost neutral model, you bundle together your reading access, subscription access, plus your average APC spend, and you combine those together. And now you get all three journals, even if you weren't subscribing to all three of them before. So I think there's some clear benefits to this, and we can think across all the different parties here. There's clear benefit to readers. They have more and easier access to reading. Because anything that is on platform, single click through, it's going to be enabled as well through things like Get FDR and the like that smooth the path to the publisher's PDF. Authors like being read. So everyone who's reading, that's an author who's enjoying being read and all the, the benefits that come being read as a scholar. You know, first of all, people cite things they need um, and the like. It also attracts authors. Um, when people can read a journal and become familiar with it and use literature from it, they become aware of the journal. Um, it's a way of leveraging past content as a way of attracting future content. So that's really good for journals as well. It increases the reading value of the transformative agreement or the reading value of the previous subscription contract. So <clears throat> you get more for your money as a library, to put it bluntly. Um, especially in these completely cost neutral models, you're getting a whole lot more for your money. So that's benefit, obviously, to libraries in the sense of the value of their end. Of course, it also helps publishers who can say, look, this is much valuable to you, and it positions them more strongly in the library budget to maintain that primacy. It's minimal cost to the publisher. In most cases, libraries aren't going to start picking up individual subscriptions to these titles. We're not at a time of expanding library subscriptions. Um, and the content's already being published. It's already on platform. It's already got an entitlement later over it. It's really a matter of flipping that from deny access to enable access. Now, I know publishers in the room are telling me I just overstated the simplicity, but the point here is it's minimal cost to add an entitlement under these. And it's a one-time thing, the most part, to flip that on. As I said, there's low risk of canalizing subscription sales. It's highly likely. And if anyone is actually doing anything but bundling up their journals this way, they're canceling them in the U.S. We're seeing, you know, we're not paying OA publishing and on top of which is canceling titles. Um, it leverages paywalled content to incentivize contracting for publishing services. So to the degree to which publishers are seeking to transform their business models away from subscription and towards publishing, this is a mechanism for doing so. Saying we have something we throw in to make this better for you. Um, and then it facilitates the eventual transition to career publish agreements. So in theory, at some point, these hybrid journals are going to flip to being OA journals. And we're starting to see, you know, an occasional flip here and there. Those publishers that have transformative agreements with a given library and institution are obviously well positioned to transition those into pure publish agreements. There's no need for a subscription set to those titles any longer, particularly if the back file has been paid for through the ways we have for contracting for back file. There are some considerations, one might even say um, concerns. Um, this strategy is only available to legacy publishers with paywalled back files and hybrid journal offerings. 
So if we are looking at new entrants into the market, if we are looking at those pure OA publishers, they have to compete with publishers that we already have subscription content to. So depending if you're one of the new entrants to the field trying to only publish OA or legacy publisher, this bullet point um, sort of cuts cuts one way or the other. For libraries, it's a little concern because we have to ask ourselves, which model do we want to try and support and incentivize? Obviously, as a result, hardens library lock-in legacy publishers. And libraries might be particularly concerned about this, about the ways their budgets are increasingly locked in. This happened with subscription big deal. It happens more with the transformative agreement and then eventually the pure publish agreement. It also sets a pricing foundation for those future pure published agreements, particularly in publish and read contracts. So Project Deal has already essentially made the transition to this is how much we're paying and we're paying on the basis of publishing. Um, so it's, um, you know, this starts to set a foundation what those pure publishing agreements are going to be charging. So de again, depending sort of where you're situated relative to this time is going to affect how you're feeling about these considerations and where you actually see some of them as benefits or some of them as concerns. So one of the challenges of being virtual in this environment is I have no idea if I stunned you all into silence or the chat on the on-air platform is going gangbusters. I, I have no idea. I can't see his face either. So um, I will go to my last here, which invites questions and comments. Um, I'll even take a comment that is, you know, a question that's really a comment, as long as at the end you say, what do you think about Lisa? Um, so Rick Anson is somewhere in the room there and is um, facilitating the on-air chat platform. Um, here's my contact information, including my Twitter handle. I'm going to stop sharing so I at least see the room a little better. And I will see what Rick has for me. One, uh, I do have one question from the chat. Uh, and, it, and it is on the first few slides, Lisa mentioned that the costs were neutral for the libraries, as in not increasing their cost when switching from subscription to read and publish. But how does that stay the same, bundling subscriptions and OA costs into the agreement? Sure. So let's, let's start with, this is what libraries want. Now, publishing services plus all the subscriptions at the same price we were paying before. I'm not saying that every publisher is providing that deal. <laughs> um, and, you know, the dynamic of negotiations come into play. So part of when I say cost neutral and then filling in the APCs, um, cost neutral, is a, it sounds like an objective statement, but cost neutral relative to what? So cost neutral relative to the subscription spend, sometimes we say that. Sometimes we cost neutral relative to the subscription spend plus the historic APCs in the wild, to use the, the phrasing of that Spring Nature report, where we're saying, okay, well, institutionally, we were paying this for subscription and one-offs for APs. We'll bundle those together. It's still cost neutral for the institution. You will also see sometimes claims that particular agreements are either cost neutral or even save money. And typically when they say they save money, they're comparing it to if everyone was publishing open access like they'd be under this transformative agreement, here's what the cost would be. And look, we got it down. So it's higher than our subscription spend, but it's less than paying rack rates, if you will, for the APs. So one always has to read the fine print in these contracts to really understand what is the comparator in order to know whether something is truly cost neutral or saving funds. So we don't have any additional uh, comments online at the moment. So of course I'd invite uh, anyone in the room who has a question or comment to please come up to one of the microphones. There are four of them distributed around the edge of the room uh, and at least be able to see and hear you. So 
Hello, Lisa. Uh, it's Charles Watkinson here from the University of Michigan Library. Um, and um, there's a comment, and then there's a question. And the comment is, it's interesting to think about this for books as well, with the sort of subscribed open type book models, which are incentivized uh, by access backlist. And um, the question is, isn't this kind of a nightmare to administer a library level in terms of turning on stuff for a limited period of time and then having to turn it again? Because I know at a book level, that is a huge pain. Why would we be turning it on again, Charles? And I think that's maybe where I'm transferring book, uh, book models into the, uh, yeah, I think that's where I'm getting the things, uh, there's a difference there. So, with the book models, like the MI Press Direct to Open and the Megan Fund to Mission, you're only getting access to the backlist content for the period that you're paying for the front list. And so that means that you're not very incentivized as a library to put that in the library catalog. But that's not true of the journals, is it? You don't lose right. access. Okay. Yeah, okay, so now I understand a little bit more. I was like, why are we losing access? We just got access. So, <laughs> I mean, in reality, right, we don't have to renew our transitive agreements, although now we've got, now we're paying for faculty to publish, so those are going to be kind of hard to cancel, to be honest. But um, presumably could actually say, we don't want a reading subscription anymore, we just want it for the publishing, and that'd be another round of negotiations. Um, a couple of things. Um, libraries are very used to turning on and off content <laughs> in especially journals, and we typically pay a service um, to assist with that, some sort of e-source management system. And of course, the publishers are also going to be helping out that because with GetFTR, for example, those publishers that have joined GetFTR are you know, managing an entitlement system across the industry that they are responsible for turning Nexus on and off, if you will, in the entitlements databases that they maintain. Because really on the library side, what we're signaling as users have entitlements. It's a publisher platform where those entitlements are actually enacted, if you will, that, that the publisher is actually saying, oh yes, I recognize you, you count this. I think with things like direct to open and flip it open, um, which are different models, and some subscribe to open have this issue as well. So subscribe to open mostly functioning on journal content right now. Um, you may have, while you are a subscriber under one of these um, models, have access to paid content that might go away if that offer is no longer made or you no longer choose to opt into it. In such cases, there is going to be this challenge of we maintain a um, local database of our own books, um, and those books, um, we don't have the same kinds of automated feeds. And I know Charles was on my panel at Charleston conference, pre-conference on O books, where we tried to sort of grapple this very particular issue. But it's also this issue of non-way things that are in that package, where the metadata needs to go back and forth to the publisher. So I am hopeful that we will see that we need to work this out better, but the side of this is quite different than the journal side of it. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Charles. We have another question from the floor. Heather? Um, hi, Lisa. It's Heather Staines. It's so good to you. Wish it was in person. Hopefully soon. Um, at Delta, I think we're, we're talking to a lot of publishers who are thinking about the administrative burden that some of these interesting, uh, maybe uh, experimental, you know, imaginative types of agreements bring, you know, with, I'm not sure how much you're involved, um, you know, uh, with your staff, but just um, some publishers use, like, rights link for scientific communication through CCC, other publishers, large publishers have bespoke systems, but each one of these models has perhaps a different administrative burden on the library side. How much of that is an issue? Do you think that that's a big problem, you know, coming up? You know, what's the, the chatter from the, the library side? So, it's important to say right here that I don't do this work in my library. Um, I, this is my scholarly focus, is to look at scholarly communications and publishing. 
I actually do in the library is OCR program to educate users on how to do library research, and particularly that's aimed at students. So it's completely different. So speaking more generally as somebody who goes to a lot of webinars and listens to people talk about these things in order to understand what's happening in the field. Um, and then also uh, following work, say, from NS, and I believe Alicia Wise is probably in the room somewhere there. Um, and the work that she has done uh, with Lorraine. Um, we know that these agreements have an infrastructure challenge. And that challenge is not just on the library side, it's also on the publisher side, particularly for smaller publishers. A lot of this right now is handled manually. Um, we see the bringing up of different dashboards, like the OA switchboard or different uh, rights links or the like, help facilitate this. But at the moment, it is incredibly bespoke work to administer a transformative agreement on the publishing side, um, same for pure publish. Um, on the description side of the stuff we get asked to, that's just, you know, we manage that stuff all the time. It's very routine. We don't management workflows for publishing. And if you look at, say, the workflow documents that Wiley has put up for managing the, the project deal and how the data has to flow in order to get those payments aligned, you've got um, a service unit involved, you've got all the institutions involved, you've got Wiley. People have to make different decisions at different points to say, yes, this person can publish under this agreement. It's very, very bespoke. Um, I did a session at UKSE last year virtually on this issue of workflows for transformative agreements. Um, and I, it's, it's very early days um, and with minimal standardization as well across the industry right now of um, sort of what what uh, what enables somebody to publish under a transformative agreement? When does it kick in? Is it at the point of acceptance of the manuscript? Is it the point of submission of the manuscript? There's just so many variables that are not standardized at this point. Thank you. I feel my answer was as rolling and as sort of bespoke the process is right now. <laughs> oh, perfect. Thank you. <laughs> So there's an there's an interesting debate going on in the chat right now. I, I'm not sure Excellent. whether anybody is seeing it. I can't see that. So. Okay. Um, one commenter said uh, Project Deal ran uh, a 5.6 million euro deficit in 2020. This is far off of cost neutrality. Someone else responded and said uh, the visualizations here with a link show how the deal agreements are actually saving the German research community money. And then the first commenter said, I'm not sure if that was working, but the annual report is telling a different story and offered a link to the annual report. Uh, Lisa, I'm not sure to what degree uh, the economic project deal or something that you've studied specifically, but I'm just wondering if you have any comment on, uh, on the argument uh, that's going on about whether or not project deal is actually cost neutral. Yep, absolutely. First of all, I'm going to say Rick, I need you to send me all those links in an email or something um, because I definitely want to make sure I get a chance. To, I want to make sure I've read all of these documents. Uh, I did see the modeling toolkit or whatever that they put out. Um, so I think what might be happening is that the product deal agreement, and I'm just going to talk about the Wiley one that I know uh, that I've read more and have seen more about. Um, so talk about it as a transformative agreement, but the actual Wiley deal agreement is a three part deal. One part is a transformative agreement, which is for the hybrid journals. There's a peer publish agreement also in there, which is for discounted APCs in old OA or journals. So you've got a transformative agreement part, uh, a goal, a peer publish agreement part. You also had a one-time backfile purpose. And then on every article that's published open access, there is a service fee from the, um, the organization that's administering this agreement to the institutions that's a processing fee, an administrative fee. So a given, so it's actually, um, three parts in the agreement with Wiley, transformative, pure publish, and file. And then you also have this, um, this unit that's managing it. So there's quite a complication. So if we only look
look at the transformative agreement part of the wheel, the wide deal agreement, that is based and matches up pretty well to subscription spend. But as I mentioned, there's these other parts. Let's leave the back file. That's a one time. The gold OA side of it um, was an uncontrolled part. And you read my scholarly kitchen piece back when that contract was put out. I said, like, it's unclear, like, how, like, Wiley can actually make more here. And, and whether it can be controlled is an interesting question. So I don't know the actual report. So I'm just telling you from having read the documents that it looked like a mechanism in there for gold OA to, to overrate things. Um, I also don't know if the organization ran a deficit because library didn't pay them. <laughs> so, because remember there's, they're the ones actually holding the contract with Wiley. And so, uh, the other institution, right? So there's an internal to Germany. I certainly saw a report from the U15 um, a couple a year or so ago saying like this needs to get balanced because under this publish agreement, a bunch of us have more that we have paid for uh, than we ever did for in subscriptions because while well, it be neutral overall, it doesn't make it neutral for each institution. Now, I definitely don't want to pretend that I am calling Campbell, who's definitely the person who you know should be the one speaking to this. Um, but I'm, I can imagine that these two are not incompatible with each other. You can have both marketing that says the transformative agreement part is cost neutral and that the overall agreement can run a deficit. All right. Uh, we have another uh, question from the floor. Robert? Hi, Lisa. That was really good. Thank you. Um, I'm just putting myself in shoes of scholar who may be at an institution that doesn't part, cannot participate in such deals. What happens to me? Um, I'm, I'm well, about equity. <laughs> uh, what happens to you? Well, what a great question. Um, first of all, I point out that we do have some, ex I, I believe it's Research for Life is doing work to work with the publishers to enable OA publishing. Um, just like the publishers enabled Seawald reading um, in certain cases. Now, that's not sufficient to this, and let's say you're at a rich institution that's not, or you're in a well-to-do country. Your, your actual institution may not be well-to-do, um, but you don't have this kind of agreement. So you're, you're with Rack Break then. Um, you're with the rate that the publishers publish on their website if you want to publish open access. And then we can all talk, think too about the um, the issue of you know author choice in where they publish and the way funder mandates may impinge on that if they're at an institution that can't afford a transformative agreement. But you know, Robert, that I could give a whole talk on that it with Plan S and the way those mechanisms are working as well, or KRI and the like. But you are absolutely correct that if your institution isn't paying, your institution isn't paying and such. If you don't have somebody else funding it, you'll be looking at figuring out how to fund it yourself, or you'll be publishing closed, and then we'll have this question of whether you can meet your mates. All right, we do have uh, another question online. Um, what could the role of subscription agents, if anything, be in transformative agreements? Uh, great question. Um, I believe in the company of biologists site that I noticed that it says you can get their transformative agreement through Edo and other subscription services. I, I think that this is probably more likely to be functioning for those smaller publishers with a limited number of titles. Um, when we get to a certain size, the publishers bring that in-house and essentially act as their own subscription agency because they're also acting as their own platform, their own entitlement system, et cetera. So I think that as um, smaller journals move in this direction, if they're able to, they'll be sort of working much under almost like a subscription model at the title level or at a very small bundle. Um, and we won't see the kind of um, transformative agreement where you have like a certain number of articles you publish under it, which historically we would have probably called more an auditing agreement, but those have sort of got subsumed 
Um, with smaller publishers, it'll probably be more now you can publish. But there are some additional um, challenges there because if my institution sometimes publishes in one of your three journals, how often do we? So you could have this real challenge if you move to a complete published, open, pure published model in that your, your income a given institution could be kind of all over the place. So again, I want to point people to Alicia Wise's work. Um, and she's the one who pointed me to the company biologist. Great website with a lot of documentation. So I thank her for that. Um, of what the implications are for smaller publishers. But yes, libraries will also be working with subscription agents for that same reason, so that we can sort of bundle up, if you will, um, these agreements with smaller publishers in order to make them more manageable. Okay, we do have, uh, we've got, now I realize we're just about out of time. Mark gave permission to cheat a couple more minutes, so okay. uh, we'll take a question very quickly from the floor and then someone who wishes to pose a live question online. Excellent. So it's Rod Cookson from IWA Publishing. Thanks, Rich. Very interesting talk. Um, the extra usage is, is great with the republish agreements. The extra visibility and engagement, the extra open access is fantastic. Um, what, what do you think about the rolling forward some legacy issues of big deals that locks in a great deal of revenue, library budgets, um, and you mentioned Alicia's work on Marops 3 project, which is very helpful to smaller publishers like our own company. Um, there is a sequence to the agreements that libraries can sign, so the bigger deals get signed first. Um, so there, there's a degree of carrying the previous system forward. What, what do you think of those questions that it is? It's preserving some of the, um, perhaps, uh, not unfairness, it's some of the structure that's been in place in library purchasing historically. And you are absolutely correct. That is exactly doing that. And that is, um, uh, there's two things. Um, one is that many publishers would like to see that case, um, that this preserve those kinds of relationships. But I think we should also remember that Transformative agreements were, didn't come on the market with the intention of disrupting the publishing system. They were actually created and, and imagined as a mechanism for not disrupting the publishing system and making an orderly transition to open access by saying, here is a mechanism where we can contract and ensure revenue streams for publishers. In fact, I, I was on multiple webinars where I would hear that the whole point here is that we can ensure publishers that they have a consistent revenue stream during this transition. So it's it's not, it, we need to understand that that was actually the purpose and that was it. That's not a bug, that's a feature of the transformative agreement from the perspective of people who invented this and brought it on the scene. So this doesn't mean that everyone agrees that that's a feature, but it was intentional that it would be non-disruptive to the publishing system to have transformative agreements that are built on subscription agreements. And it looks like Jennifer has joined us. I'm guessing she is our live questioner. Yes, that's correct. Looks like we just need to get Jennifer unmuted. Hello there. Hello. Can you hear me? Hi. Yes. Hi, Lisa. Thanks so Hello. much for that um, presentation. Really interesting. Think about the flip side of the read and publish, which a lot of us involved with open access are very focused on the publish side. So I was just wondering, in terms of um, the sort of costs and the benefits around read and publish deals, and whether what your thoughts are on having in the information that we get from publishers information on rejections and submissions that haven't been accepted um, any information around those two that would kind of help us give us as librarians a more of an insight into what our researchers may be trying to submit what they're trying to submit and see if you know, what insights we could gain from that sort of information. 
That's an interesting question because obviously once libraries enter into these agreements and into, if you will, correspondence with the publishers on the publishing side of the, the house, rather than just the reading side of the house, the potential for us to come to agreement that additional data would be shared with the library. I think we'd want to, on the library side, probably uh, treat that data very carefully. Um, I think many of our faculties and researchers would think that it is none of business of the library where they were, especially where they were rejected from. Um, I think that, that would be, um, they are used to having that particular data point very private unless they choose to make it public. So I think we'd need to do some discussion with our sort of our university and our community around what it would mean for that. I'm not saying we making it public in the sense of publishing it on a website, but what would it mean for that information to move to a sort of institutionally visible data point? Because I don't think what we want is, for example, to have a list of the most rejected scholars, right? Because um, <laughs> part of it is that would drive people towards uh, placing their articles in more sure journals which of course may be um, not the direction that we want to drive user behavior in or researcher behavior in. So we have to really think through what are the implications. I, it, one can easily imagine such reports and data flows. I think we really would want to think through the indirect impacts of the library having that insight, who would actually then want that insight and how we would manage sort of and protect that data on behalf of our researchers. It's kind of a, a it's kind of a privacy question um, in a in a different way than we usually librarians think about privacy. Yeah, thanks, Lisa. If I could just, there is time for me just to come back. It's a bit of a bit of an analogous like with research offices, offices that maybe want to know about what grants their researchers mm -hmm. are applying for. That kind of information. I'm just putting it out there. Yeah. So yeah, thank you yeah. very much for your thoughts on yeah. these. Thank well, you. Well, and I'm going to say, Jennifer, thank you because you win the prize of being to be willing to come live on the Zoom. So um, with me, um, I think Rick was letting know that Mark is asking us to bring this to a closure at this point. I would thank everyone for the opportunity to speak with you. I hope next year um, together. Um, in the meantime, I'm Lisa Librarian on all social media and would look forward to hearing from any of you and Lisa Librarian at Gmail as well. Thank Everyone, you. Everyone, please join thanking Lisa. And now I believe it's time to go to our second uh, workshop session. Thanks very much. <laughs>